as you know, this event is about blasphemy and democracy. And as some of you may know, that's been a, uh, a kind of research area for the Cancer Extremism Project. And myself, I think um, a few months ago, I published a, a research paper, which was um, very kindly supported by one of our guest speakers today. Um, so, I, so I owe a great deal for that. Um, but we managed to basically identify 70 or 80 plots, assassination attempts, uh, attacks, um, both, you know, failed, successful, intercepted, all sorts of different uh, attacks, going all the way back to the original Satanic Versus affair, uh, which I think is when um, blasphemy really came back onto the radar for a lot of Western countries, obviously. And then in just in August 2022, we actually saw 30 years after that fatwa, um, it finally catch up with the author himself, who's uh, stabbed on stage, received serious injuries, Sir Salman Rushdie, um, but thankfully managed to survive and appears to have retained his sense of humour, which is fantastic. Um, so I think one of the reasons I wanted to do this discussion now, as well as it being an ongoing uh, theme of research for us, was I think since uh, maybe prior to October the 7th, obviously events, uh, the Israel-Hamas war have, have ta has taken off since, um, I think that blasphemy and the security implications from it were probably, um, it's fair to say, the overriding concern for a number of Western countries, um, both from uh, Islamist extremism in, in maybe its non-violent uh, sense, but also from jihadist terrorism as well. Um, I think a lot of organizations like Al-Qaeda and ISIS as various franchises around the world were really ratcheting up the rhetoric um, to do with blasphemy when it comes to what was happening in Sweden and Denmark, where we saw uh, various I guess, provocateurs um, engaging in Quran burning stunts. And I think there's been um, some incidents recently in the Netherlands as well. Um, so this really looked like, um, yeah, the security concern, but also also a diplomatic and a social concern as well. Because it's obviously not just about the terror threat or the extremists. It's about, you know, it touches on questions of freedom of expression, of integration and all of that. And uh, Denmark and Sweden in particular were singled out for massive global um boycott campaigns, um, a massive amount of diplomatic pressure from um, countries, in the, from governments in the Middle East um, as well. So um, I think one of the reasons that we've got the speakers that we've had today is that Denmark, in response to that, actually introduced a piece of legislation, which I know that um, Jacob, one of our speakers, has been very outspoken about. Um, but in essence, I won't won't go into the, the detail, but in essence, it criminalizes what's called the inappropriate treatment of religious objects. Uh, or texts, which something uh, which I think in in local coverage is, has become just known as the Quran law, um, because people know that it's about the Quran, it's not about religious texts and religious objects more generally. So I think um, our two speakers today will have a really interesting perspective on this because they are both Danish, um, but they are both based in the United States. So um, live under the First Amendment, where probably the legislation that Denmark has introduced would be constitutionally impossible, I imagine. Um, so first of all, we've got, um, oh, actually, and both of them have been with us, I think, for a couple of events for Counter Extremism Project. So thank you for those. But this is the first time we've had them together. Um, so first of all, we've got uh, Professor Jutta Clausen at Brandis University, who's the curator of the Western Jihadism Project, which was an enormous resource for me, um, collecting my data on blasphemy plots. And, and uh, Professor Clausen's students were an enormous help there as well. Um, she was also more recently the author of uh, Western Jihadism, A 30-Year History, which I think is just a phenomenal book. So not exactly what we're talking about today, but I think um, I would strongly recommend it. But before that was also, um, I guess, the chronicler of the definit definitive account of the uh, 2005 Yulin's Poston affair, the cartoons affair, which I think is fair to say had a massive impact on Denmark's um, recent policies and legislations that, that it's adopted. So I think some really interesting perspectives uh, we'll get there. And then we've got Jacob Machangama, who um, is the CEO of Justicia, which is a human rights think tank. Um, but also more recently, uh, Jacob, correct me if I'm wrong, but you founded a new Future of Free Speech uh, project at Vanderbilt University. Uh, and he's also the author of another fantastic book, which is Free Speech, a History uh, from Socrates to Social Media. So um, a bunch of book recommendations for all of our audience there, if you haven't, um, haven't read them. So what we'll do is we'll give um, both Yitta and Jacob uh, a few minutes to have some opening remarks. And then um, I want to keep this one nice and engaging and nice and open. So if there's questions, um, please don't hesitate to drop them in the chat um, as any, as everybody's speaking. And I'll get do my best to come to as many as I can. We've got a really healthy audience, um, around 50 people in at the moment. So hopefully plenty of discussion. Um, 
So, Percy, to Klaus, and maybe you can take us away, uh, take the floor first of all, and kind of set the scene of um, the West's, I guess, roiling blasphemy affairs and controversies uh, that we've seen going on for several decades. Might need to unmute. Here we go. Um, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Liam, <clears throat> for your uh, very sweet, um, generous uh, uh, introduction. Uh, I am struck uh, by where we are today uh, with this whole question of uh, blasphemy um, and uh, how this has become both a, um, a thing to play with in domestic politics by uh, it's, uh, the so-called Islam critics uh, who uh, use it uh, to, to provoke uh, and get attention for electoral purposes. Uh, it's uh, striking when you look at these events uh, that uh, time and time again, there is a, a single person or a small group of people who are stating these um, uh, Quran burning episodes. Uh, and then there's a huge ring of police all around them and um, more media people than there are demonstrators. And sometimes there are also, uh, we have seen some really violent um, riots in Gothenburg uh, in particular. Uh, and it's just become a routine. It's a template that's acted out again and again. Uh, and it's used also now in national politics. We've seen Turkey, um, compelling these uh, new legislation uh, in order to allow uh, Sweden to join NATO. So um, when we go back and think about how this all started, it started in, in uh, 1989 with uh, the Iranian Supreme Leader, uh, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, issuing uh, a FAPA, uh, an edict uh, to kill anybody associated with um, the Satanic Verses, uh, Salman Rushdie's uh, book, uh, uh, which has a sort of Muhammad-like character uh, who comes down to earth and uh, engages in various human-like uh, uh, behaviors. Uh, from a Danish perspective, um, it's worth remember that we actually in Denmark had um, a huge controversy uh, about uh, uh, an artist who wanted to do a movie about Jesus's sex life and was given money from the government to produce uh, this, uh, this movie. And um, uh, uh, Christian groups uh, were uh, very upset and uh, regarded it as, as blasphemy. So we have been uh, on a really disjunctured uh, path about this issue at the same time that uh, uh, Khomeini uh, and riled up uh, Shia Muslims uh, to anchor their demonstrations all over uh, United Kingdom, uh, book, uh, uh, the satanic verses uh, was burned in big demonstrations. Uh, there were actually firebombing also uh, bookstores uh, here in the United States. And uh, there were, for several years, um, people associated with the book um, from Tokyo to Oslo um, to Italy uh, were attacked and stabbed uh, translators, uh, publishers, etc. Uh, at that time, uh, the publisher, uh, Penguin, uh, went out of its way to keep the book uh, in circulation. Uh, and this was a moment uh, when uh, free speech was uh, very much supported. Uh, and uh, the sense was that uh, this was it was important not to give in to this type of, of pressure. Now, today, um, 30 years uh, plus, uh, we are in a very different situation. And we suddenly seen uh, after uh, Scandinavia was Denmark, but also in the UK, uh, all blasphemy laws were um, taken off the books. Uh, and uh, now we are seeing them getting uh, reintroduced. But 
wrapped up in uh, in a different uh, in in a, in a respect for diversity, uh, the language uh, with which these uh, this legislation is being introduced is is very different. And uh, but when we think about uh, where we are now, uh, there has been a convergence between the Shia prohibition against Salman Rushdie, but also the uh, the, the Sunni uh, Islamist anger about um, uh, defamation of the prophet. And uh, it was actually very late uh, that Al-Qaeda uh, and bin Laden uh, got into this game. It wasn't until uh, 2000, March 2008 that um, bin Laden got uh, an opinion about the Danish cartoons, which had been published three years earlier. Uh, and but since then we have uh, had um, Bin Laden's uh, was clearly involved in uh, the planning of a bombing of uh, the uh, Danish um, uh, consulate embassy in Islamabad, uh, and we know that there were three major efforts uh, to uh, bomb uh, the. Uh, uh, editorial offices of the newspaper, both in Copenhagen, but also the one in 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 Jotland, um, which was actually at the time uh, the main office uh, and where the infamous um, original publication of the twelve satirical drawings um, that ostensibly uh, were supposed to um, be portrayals of Muhammad. As a matter of fact, they weren't all pictures of Muhammad. Some were, some weren't. Some of the cartoonists actually mocked the newspaper editors rather than uh, following up on on the 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 uh, suggestion that they should uh, draw Muhammad as uh, as they saw him, which was originally how the editors of the newspaper had presented uh, the the charge that led to the publication of these these drawings, and uh, it's. Uh, now today, uh, we don't really see these types of massive uh, terrorism incidents that uh, resulted in the uh, January 2015 attack on uh, the offices of Charlie Hebdo in Paris. Uh, there is uh, a continuous trickle of uh, uh, individuals who attack uh, people, school teachers, um, who have um, decided to either show or discuss uh, the free speech issue around um, uh, the Charlie Hebdo affair and um, and the Danish newspaper, and um, it's uh, in some regards actually I would argue that this is where Al Qaeda has really succeeded. Uh, when we think about uh, the nine eleven attacks, which were intended on the Bin Laden really did expect that uh, the United States uh, would withdraw uh, from uh, Afghanistan and withdraw uh, from 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 which he had a completely unrealistic expectations uh, based on his uh, belief that uh, it was uh, his people who were responsible for the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, he thought that uh, and wrote about it and talked about uh, United States as an imperial power on play feet, borrowing language actually from Mao Zedong uh, to under understand and describe uh, what he thought was uh, a paper tiger, uh, an imperialistic uh, paper tiger that would uh, collapse. 9-11 uh, produced uh, a massive expansion of the security state, but um, there was no, uh, there was no victory there anywhere for Al Qaeda uh, or for its affiliates. But when we think about uh, the whole argument about blasphemy uh, and apostasy, uh, two different things, um, but uh, mostly have been all wrapped up in the question of, of blasphemy. So blasphemy is uh, insulting uh, religious uh, figures or objects, whereas apostasy is, uh, uh, when if a Muslim leaves the faith, and and uh, so actually Salman Rusty was guilty both of blasphemy and apostasy. Uh, the 
that is now um, a campaign that I would say the extreme groups uh, in the uh, global movement really have, have won. Uh, it has become generally accepted that uh, you can't uh, show images uh, of, uh, of the Muslim prophet or Muhammad. Uh, museums have withdrawn Persian illustrated manuscripts, uh, uh, Ottoman manuscripts that showed uh, Muhammad. Uh, so there's a, a whole history there of um, actually depictions of Muhammad in Islam, in, in Islamic art, uh, that has now been withdrawn from, from uh, public view. Uh, so I, I, in some regards, I consider this one of the uh, really uh, saddest aspect uh, of uh, this whole um, debacle, uh, namely that uh, even Muslims can no longer you know, actually interrogate or investigate and look at their own uh, art history. Um, we have uh, comprehensively uh, decided to miseducate everybody about the nature of Islam. It is uh, accepted that uh, Muslims uh, will not tolerate free speech. Uh, this is, generally speaking, uh, what uh, the extremists on both among the Islam critics, but also in the Islamist movement, I uh, wish to um, convey, and, and they have succeeded. Uh, we see that uh, in universities, we see it in schools. Um, and um, uh, I, I find that uh, really, uh, a, a, it's a cultural catastrophe. Let me put it that way. I remember you, um when we were talking about my research, I remember you saying to me that you think arguably, um, you know, things like the Charlie Hebdo massacre, but you know, arguably this was Al Qaeda's most successful strategy or, uh, and I was really struck by that comment. So I was really pleased to hear you elaborate on it here. Um, yeah, and it's, I, I think you're right. I think it's striking that you saw this a lot after Samuel Patti, the school teacher was capitated uh, just outside of Paris um, in 2020. There was kind of, like an acceptance or a normalization of the of the limits of the limits set by the guys with Kalashnikovs. Like there was there was a kind of implicit in the in the commentary was well, you know, Samuel Patti shouldn't have shown those cartoons in a discussion about freedom of expression, even though it got lost that, you know, he gave students the chance to leave. And in fact the student who made the complaint was not even present in the class when it happened. Um but it was, yeah, it just seemed implicit in the commentary that, you know, this is this is something that you shouldn't do. But in fact, as you rightly say, that's a relatively recent development and phenomenon, um, which seems to be, yeah, we've accepted the terms laid out by the guys with Kalashnikovs or knives, um, if that's fair to, fair to say. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, Jacob, do you want to take the floor? Yes, thank you so much, uh, Liam. Thanks for for uh, convening this roundtable and for giving me the opportunity to to participate. So, <clears throat> from a historical point of view, uh, blasphemy um, obviously has very long and deep roots. Uh, impiety was one of the charges leveled against Socrates, uh, for instance. Um, although scholars disagree about what was the exact uh, crime he was he he, he was uh, sentenced for. Um, and of course, um, in, in the history of the West, um, blasphemy uh, has very often been been brutally um, punished. Um, you know, and and even in in the UK, where you sit in now, uh, Liam, up until uh, the nineteenth uh, century, um, you could be sent to prison for years if you engaged in blasphemy. So my favorite example is Richard Carlyle, who was this deist um, who who called uh, for religious uh, toleration and for for uh, equal equal suffrage. Uh, and he spent something like six years on and off in prisons for selling um, um, Tom Paine, the works of Tom Paine. 
uh, that were quite critical of Christianity to the lower classes. You could sell uh, the works of Tom Paine uh, to the to the well-educated elite, but not to the to the lower classes who might get the wrong ideas uh, and no longer accept sort of the class-based uh, structure of of British uh, society. What is interesting, actually, um, about uh, Islam is that if you go back to medieval Islam, and uh, actually in in, in Persia, modern modern day Iran, you find some of the the world's first um, what you might call with with modern vocabulary free thinkers. Um, so someone like um, the um, uh, Persian physician and philosopher Abu Bakr Muhammad ibn Zakaria al Razi, on, on known as as Rasis, who lived from around 850 to 925, and he wrote, uh, he was very critical of uh, the restrictions that religious fanaticism placed on free thought. He said, for instance, that if the people of a given religion are asked about the proof for the soundness of their religion, they flare up, get angry, and spill the blood of whoever confronts them with this question. They forbid rational speculation and strive to kill their adversaries. This is the truth, why truth became thoroughly silenced and concealed. And so you actually had uh, thinkers in the Islamic tradition who were far more radical when it comes to three, freedom of thought than their contemporaries in uh, in, in Western uh, Christendom. Uh, unfortunately, um, that sort of uh, um, branch of, of free thinking uh, died out um, and, and did not uh, become, uh, become dominant. Um, what is particularly, I think, concerning to me about the Danish law that you mentioned that um, criminalizes the improper treatment of uh, of sacred religious texts, it is that it marks a um, a complete uh, paradigm shift. So back in 2017, Denmark became one of many um, Western open democracies to uh, to abolish blasphemy bans. So you've seen a, a range of these. A blasphemy bans being a, being repealed in Norway, in the Netherlands, uh, even in in Catholic Ireland. Um, um, so so th that was sort of an an idea that international human rights norms on blasphemy uh, on on freedom of expression had now crystallized to the point where blasphemy was low, no longer acceptable. And this built upon a, a a big victory in 2011 at the United Nations Human Rights Council. So for a number of years, the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, had pushed very hard to criminalize blasphemy under uh, international human rights norms. Uh, this process began all the way back in, in 1990, but really picked up steam after the publication of the, the Danish cartoons. And, and the OIC, um, led by Iran and Pakistan, and managed to garner support for these resolutions against the defamation of religions. But <clears throat> finally, in 2011, Western states got their act together and defeated these resolutions. And, and, and sort of a consensus emerged that human rights protect individuals. They don't uh, protect religions or uh, religious symbols. Um, and 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 so even even though you would obviously see um, threats against people who uh, were perceived to blaspheme, both in the West um, but also in in Islamic states, that, that you know anyone who's followed developments in in Pakistan and Afghanistan will have will, will have seen Nigeria as well. Horrific examples of people who are often falsely accused of of desecrating the the Quran or offending. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad, who are who who are killed by by mob action, um, but but at the very least, there was this consensus internationally and in Western countries that blasphemy was no longer an acceptable restriction on free speech, and so for Denmark to now change its mind due to pressure from the OIC and threats from from Al Qaeda, to me, um, is a huge setback for secular values uh, for for freedom of expression and 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 really a victory for the OIC states that had been defeated back in 2011 saying you know 
okay, we're back on track to actually having the idea that that blasphemy can and should be be punished even through criminal law um and 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 ominously before the danish law was accepted there was a resolution in the human rights council where the oic once again managed to get a, a majority of states and and if you look at the voting records you will see that the states that voted in favor uh, of this resolution include for instance china which is pretty ironic given that if you go to the Xinjiang province in uh, in China, people are being, um, Muslims are being sent uh, to prison for owning a Quran. Yet China felt perfectly happy to vote for very cynical reasons with the uh, OIC states uh, in, a, in, a, in a way to sort of undermine international human rights norms and sort of saying, if you don't criticize our crackdowns on, on on human rights violations we won't uh, criticize yours um and so denmark uh, one of the most secular liberal states in the world which is consistently ranks in the top three or top four when it comes to freedom of expression um and when no one and this is really important i think no one has been convicted of blasphemy since 1946 um basically has changed a seven decade consensus that free speech should not be um, restricted in order to protect religions and done so on due to pressure from authoritarian states as well as uh, terrorist groups who threatened to carry out uh, the kinds of attacks uh, that we've seen in France and elsewhere. And mind you, this is also um a very very different tone from the danish government from from the the tone that danish governments and the stances that they took after the cartoon affairs after the cartoon affair there was also huge pressure and i'm sure you 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 know have documented it meticulously liam the the amount of attacks that were foiled in in denmark due to the cartoon uh being published and the republication despite that uh, enormous pressure, Danish successive Danish governments said we won't cave into that. You know, we might not agree with it uh, with, with such cartoons. We're 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 sorry if you feel offended, but it's not the role of the Danish government to tell uh, newspapers what they do. And we have freedom of expression. Um, that that um, position has now been uh, turned on its head. And, uh, and and the Danish government has basically said that even though in its own mind it said, well, this is a minuscule restriction on free speech uh, because burning books is particularly uh, grievous and it has nothing to do with recent debate or caricatures. Um, but I think this is um, a delusional um, way to rationalize uh, caving in to, pre to to pressure from authoritarian states and and religious violent extremists, because if you accept that religious dogma um, should be protected um, through the use of criminal law, well, then these um, um, authoritarian states and others will come back and say, well, you've already accepted this premise. Here are other things that we find egregious. Um, why would you not then tolerate um, a, a caricatures of, of, of the prophet? Uh, you know, these hurt our feelings too. These also uh, threaten the, 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 the security and social peace of your country. Please do something about it. And, and by abandoning principle, I think Denmark has invited further attack. And even, even worse, I think they have really... Um, undermined the attempt at the international level to sort of say blasphemy bans are just incompatible with human rights norms. And Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and Iran will use the Danish law aggressively in international fora. And also when they're criticized uh, for what they do at home, they will say, yes, we punish blasphemy, um, uh, but we don't, we're not alone in the world. Look at the Danish uh, law that criminalized uh, the 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 improper treatment of uh, religious sex. It says very clearly that the, the gratuitous uh, um, uh, offense uh, of uh, religious doctrines can be punished. So, you know, this the, this is not just us. One of the most open democracies in the world does the same thing. And obviously, 
you know, there's a huge difference between how um, between the red lines of blasphemy in Denmark and Iran. You know, just last year we saw two uh, Iranian men being executed. Uh, they were hung by the Iranian regime for for atheism. And one of the charges was that they had um, apparently, you know, Iranian uh, criminal procedure is not known for its transparency and openness, but apparently they had shared telegram videos of Quran burnings. Um, so I think that is just shows the extent of really how 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 Denmark plays into the hands of authoritarian uh, regimes and emboldens this uh, offensive um, by authoritarian regimes and and those who seek through violence to uphold the jihadist veto that, you know, violence intimidation works uh, against uh, open democracies. Open democracies uh, are no longer willing to stand firm on principle. Uh, sustained pressure over the years uh, can, can pay off. And I think that's a very, very sad uh, state of affairs. Thank you so much. Um... A really powerful remarks from both of you um well like i said before if I'll, I'll ask a quick maybe a couple of follow-up questions now but um people in the audience if you want to get some questions over um you can drop them in the chat uh and like i said i'll do my best to get to them um i guess like it, it strikes me either of you can come in on this um response to this it strikes me that one of the reasons that people maybe don't want to put their head above the parapet on this is that they think that, you know, if you condemn Denmark, the Danish legislation, or we're not only talking about Denmark here, um, or if you condemn the attacks even on Charlie Hebdo, for example, what you're doing is implicitly endorsing, you know, insulting cartoons, or you're endorsing burning a Quran. Um, it, first of all, is that is that fair to say? Do you think that's fair? To, that That's one of the reasons that people, you know, maybe don't, maybe this does get so muddy uh, in the response. Then also, I guess, you know, a lot of people, and I know you touched on this, Jacob, but a lot of people will shrug their shoulders and say, well, you know, it's not a big deal that, you know, Quran burning is outlawed because, you know, that isn't particularly ugly and primitive um, thing to do. It's not, you know, it's not, you know, you, none of us on this call, I'm sure nobody in the audience would ever think that to do such a thing or think that that's a good idea. So why does it matter that that's been outlawed? And I know you did touch on this, so I'm being a bit unfair. Um, yeah, either of you can feel free to respond to that. Um, I, I agree with, with Jacob uh, and his assessment of the uh, downstream consequences uh, of what was presented as a very small concession uh, to, uh, in, in the name of, it was wrapped up as a, as a multicultural, multicultural societies need to be sensitive to uh, these types of, of feelings. But the problem is that, uh, as I said, started talking about, it stereotypes Muslims terribly uh, because, um, first of all, um, it's, uh, there is uh, this uh, history of, of uh, manuscripts and illustrations uh, uh, from both in both Ottoman and and in in Persian uh, art and uh, uh, the whole idea that uh, de depiction doesn't happen is is untrue. Uh, it, it's a historical falsification. Uh, it is true that uh, Muslims were offended by the Danish cartoons, and but as I wrote in my book from two thousand and nine about about the affair, the, the uh, I spoke with uh, leaders of, uh, you know, Secretary General of the OIC. I went to to Cairo and spoke with the head of the Arab League. And 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 the real issue at that time was not depiction. The real issue was uh, uh, Islamophobia, that the cartoons were perceived as stereotyping Muslims and. The focus was on the one cartoon that was uh, seen again and again, um, and that actually the BBC uh, showed a picture of uh, was Kurt Vestergaard's cartoon of of, of uh, an angry man with um, a turban on. Muslims don't wear turbans, but the turban was turned into a bomb, and 
it was a theme that Kurt Westergaard had used in his cartoon art for a long period of time. But now we can't even talk about the cartoons. We can't talk about the fact that some of the, the cartoonists themselves were divided among themselves about what the real problem was. And we can't, it's just been decided that A, Muslims simply don't tolerate this, and B, that those cartoons were all offensive uh, to Muslims for religious reasons rather than for secular reasons that they were. So we can't have um, a sensible debate about this anymore. And, uh, uh, you know, we have had we had a terrible episode here in the US um, at a, a small college uh, where um, an art professor had uh, uh, taken out some of these uh, Ottoman uh, uh, miniature paintings and shown them in class and was fired for it because these were deemed at, uh, according to the expert opinion that was brought in by the, the head of the university to be uh, intrinsically offensive to Muslims. So what I really object to is, is the a falsification of history that follows from these types of uh, blanket bans on, uh, on, on, on discussion and uh, uh, looking at, uh, at artwork and looking at, at the evidence. I, I, I never myself uh, really understood the cartoon art that was done by uh, Charlie Ebdo. It was um, one of the problems with uh, cartoon art is that you have to have a background. You need to see it through a certain cultural context because it's worthless satire. I mean, cartoon art is, uh, so you, you read, if you read the drawings based on, on your own historical perceptions and your understanding of context, then what, what, uh, what does this show? And I, the, uh, the French tradition uh, going back to the French Revolution, it, it's one that I don't find funny, I can't understand it, but lost in this debate was that Charlie Hebdo was equal opportunity insulting to all faiths. Every, uh, to, to, uh, their cartoons had Muhammad pushing a rabbi in a wheelchair with uh, 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 a bishop running afterwards, uh, um, wearing no clothes. I mean, it was uh, equal opportunity insulting. Uh, that too, we can't really discuss today. And then of course, it has been weaponized both by the extremists. Uh, uh, and you know, the purpose of terrorism is supposed to intimidate the general public, but it's also to intimidate Muslims. It's also to, comp what Al-Qaeda has done over the years has always aimed uh, at, at affecting the Muslim global audience and get Muslims to take their side in this big debate about the nature of Islam and what is allowed in Islam and what is not allowed. And uh, uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's a really complex picture that we're dealing with today. Yeah, I think um, just to respond, like just to react to what you said, I think um, it's really striking how, you know, it used, it used to be, yeah, it's a prohibition on a depiction, but now that's got so far to the point that, as you said, we can't talk about these episodes. Samuel Patty certainly couldn't talk about these episodes in, a, in his classroom. Um, but there's been death threats against school teachers in France and other European countries simply for wanting to discuss the Charlie Hebdo attack. Um, you know, a major event in recent French history, but even discussing that is now, um, you know, you know, take, you know, now a serious risk to people's safety. Um, and uh, even, I know in the UK, there was an incident in Wakefield where uh, a copy of the Quran was allegedly accidentally scuffed, you know, scuffed, and that led to death threats for the individual at the center of it. So it's just, I mean, I, I know people talk about the slippery slope fallacy. It doesn't seem to be a fallacy in this case, and it doesn't even seem to be a slippery slope. It seems to be a bit of a cliff edge. Um, Jacob, I know you unmuted, so I assume you want to try. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely think that going back to your initial question, that one of the reasons um, people are iffy about this is not only fear, but also the, you know, that this plays into uh, not only Danish, but sort of European and Western debates about multiculturalism, about, uh, about racism, and that some of the most 
prolific quote unquote blasphemers uh, are um, also on the far right. And so it's this human beings have great um, difficulties often distinguishing between defending a principle and, and defending the underlying speech, especially if they're vehemently opposed to that uh, kind of speech. So, and they also, it's also easier for, for people to sort of compartmentalize restrictions on free speech if, if those targeted are people that they think use their speech irresponsibly. But, but I, you know, I, I really appreciate Judith's uh, comments, but I would, I think that in, in open democracies, even if there was a universal theological recognized ban on the depiction of Muhammad in Islam, that all Muslims agreed that this was blasphemous, then that wouldn't matter, in my opinion, in terms of the, the legality. You know, <clears throat> if you go, you know, Catholicism has certainly, you know, it, it, uh, up until 1966, when the index of censorship was finally uh, um, uh, abolished, there was certainly a lot of uh, of, of ideas uh, and literature that was seen as go running contrary to to Christianity, and uh, people uh, crossed those red lines all the time. A lot of people paid a very high price over the decade, over the centuries, for doing so, but. Simply put, I don't think that if you live in an in an open uh, democracy, that religions get to dictate what uh, should be said and and not, and that they get to have their uh, dictate the red lines of permissible debate or, or satire. And I think that for Muslims in particular, as a minority in the West, it is such a short-sighted strategy to argue for restrictions on free speech when you're a minority, and a minority um, that is very often, um, um, you know, where you have uh, strong political actors who are deeply skeptical of Islam and, and Muslim immigration, for instance. If you argue for restricting free speech, which really is one of the values that allow Muslims to practice their their faith and 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 freely in in Western society and which has been under pressures including in Denmark so bans against the burqa for instance um is a restriction on um on on religious speech uh um you could argue and there have also been laws in Denmark and, and elsewhere that sort of um prohibit religious preachers from saying things that undermine dem democratic values and that are you know targeted um uh, against uh, against imams and you now see in the uk um his Taria being banned um and 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 so it, you know if you're a, a minority it's a very dangerous game to play to demand restrictions on free speech because you're only ever a political majority away from being the target rather than the beneficiary of such laws. And um, um, that's a great speech um, by uh, Shiraz Mahar, who's, who's, who's also an, an, an expert, I guess, on, on Islamic terrorism, who used to be a member of his career. And he sort of tells his story of how he had to give up his religious extremism. And, and his epiphany was demonstrating in London outside the embassy of Uzbekistan, I guess, uh, against um, against Uzbekistan's oppression of Muslims. And it suddenly dawned on him that it was only in secular Britain where he had the right, even though he represented an organization that wanted to introduce a caliphate and establish religious laws that were oppressive to non-Muslims and to Muslims who didn't agree with his put to rear, you know, that allowed him to live his life according to the values that he uh, th that he sought, and then when he, when that dawned on him, he had to leave his career and uh, and and leave religious extremism, um, um, and 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 I think that's a powerful testament to what freedom of expression can do. But that requires that Western open democracies are willing to stand firm on those uh, principles and not say. Well, if you're offended, maybe we need to to change uh, our laws. I think being offended is a price you pay for being in an living in an open society, 
um, that does not, um, you know, require you by law or by coercion to live according to a, to specific uh, values. Um, that will always have, uh, that will always leave minorities, uh, um, you know, vulnerable to 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 persecution. Um, so so really, we have to cultivate. And, and the, the idea, we have to stand firm on the idea that you don't have a right not to be offended. You certainly have a right to speak out against the cartoons. It's perfectly fine to be offended by cartoons or what you might deem to be Islamophobia. That's fine. Free speech gives you the right to argue against uh, the publication of such things. But when you demand that the government should punish it, or even worse, when you take matters into your own hands and use threats or even real life violence to try and to enforce those red lines, then we have a huge problem. Hmm. Um, just had a ton of questions and comments go through. So I'm really sorry if I don't get to all of them. Um, it's a quick, quick one from Ali for Professor Clausen. So uh, you mentioned that we're still seeing lone wolf uh, in inverted commas attacks of killing teachers, uh, for example, um, and then some other smaller incidents or failed attacks. Um, but we haven't seen a terror attack organized like a group uh, terror, a group linked terror plot uh, like the Charlie Hebdo uh, attacks. Uh, why do you think that is? Um, I guess we're veering into your specialism on jihadism here. Um, is it no longer politically uh, strategic for terror organizations or is it that they can't do it? They don't have the capacity. Um, yeah, if you could give us your insights or thoughts on that one. It's really hard uh, to answer that question. Uh, it is uh, clearly the case that um, for some years now, uh, Al Qaeda has stepped back uh, from uh, carrying out uh, attacks in Western Europe and has not had the capacity to do so in the United States. Um, I speculate in my most recent book, uh, based on the evidence as I see it, that um, by the time uh, the Islamic State uh, started to carry out these uh, the massive attacks uh, in um, in Paris um, and particularly the the November two thousand and fifteen uh, uh, attack in in the Marais, uh, it was uh, in best I can tell I think uh, a, a strategic decision was made on the part of Ayman al Sabahiri. Uh, who had taken over as leader of Al Qaeda, that uh, the main goal of Al Qaeda would be to build um, a safe haven in um, in, in in Syria, and uh, that uh, you this you recall there was a split between the Islamic State and uh, Al Qaeda, and. Uh, it was the Islamic State really that uh, captured the imagination of most of the extremists in Europe, and they had the stronger networks. I, uh, Al Qaeda became, uh, to some extent, an, an aging uh, organization. Uh, but I also believe that was uh, Ayman al Sabahiri uh, uh, made a strategic decision uh, to step back uh, because. Uh, uh, the type of massive uh, terrorism uh, incidents that bin Laden had championed, championed didn't really work uh, for the organization. And uh, uh, so I, I, that that would be my interpretation of what we have seen. Uh, generally speaking, the uh, attacks we see we, and we continue to see is really are carried out by people who have been either involved with um, uh, Andam Chowdhury's uh, network of organizations uh, brought in linked under the Al Muhajirun umbrella, uh, of which uh, you know we have seen such uh, groups and uh, uh, in, in both in in Norway, in Denmark, and Holland, um, in Germany, and in France. Uh, uh, th these affiliates uh, have been behind some of the uh, incidents that we have seen. Uh, but we have also seen people who have just uh, uh, really been radicalized online. I've always been a skeptic about people self-radicalizing to the point of being able to carry out an attack simply by seeing things um, uh, on, on YouTube. Uh, but we have, uh, I mean, 
I've had to modify my view on that a little bit because there are some cases now where people we just don't see any organized impetus behind uh, these uh, these incidents, and that that includes um, I mean uh, Samuel, uh, the the decapitation of Samuel Patti. Uh, six people were uh, charged and and convicted in that case, so there was a a broader group, but it was. Um, uh, it, it it was more of a sort of a local network uh, that was involved. There were no uh, there's a standing order out from Al Qaeda uh, still uh, in place, as well as from uh, uh, AQAP. Um, if you look at uh, Anwar Al uh YouTube productions, uh, I was just looking it up two days ago. Uh, his sermon. The dust shall never settle, which was uh, um, the command to attack anybody who defend the prophet's honor and attack anybody who insults the prophet. That's still available on YouTube. I was able to just click on and type the title into YouTube and get it. It's still there. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there is an, a strong underground. But we, the whole issue about blasphemy. Uh, has really spread uh, beyond uh, these uh, types of violent group, French groups uh, to become uh, much more of a, a generalized uh, Islamist campaign. Uh, and and that, that's why I say, well, in some regards, this has been uh, the issue that Al-Qaeda has successfully mobilized on and has been able to start a cultural revolution. Uh, and, and, you know, fighting for... Uh, how people think um, is uh, and and changing people's way of thinking um, is um, is is it's a big gain. It's a big gain for the extremists. Mm. I was just thinking that as you were talking, is like maybe it's not, maybe those big attacks haven't been successful for the organisations themselves, but as you said, it's got to the point where that you know violence as a response to a perceived alleged blasphemy is kind of widespread enough that they don't need a link to a uh, specific organizations that want to take action. Um, another question from Aaron, uh, who talks about being a constitutional law, law specialist, uh, recently in a discussion with French dignitaries uh, who were concerned about the intimidation impact of uh, Samuel Paty's beheading. Um, she brought up the US heckler's veto doctrine, which essentially says that a small group may not use an event even as a pretext for silencing society at large. Uh, there are impressive legal examples to back this, uh, the silencing of Michael Oren case. Um, is Would this be valuable to share with European, I guess, policymakers, um, with people who are at the, on the front lines of this defense of freedom of, of expression? If anyone's got any reactions to that? Yeah, I think, you know, unfortunately, in in Europe, so in Europe, it's, it's the European Convention of Human Rights protects uh, freedom of expression uh, and the European Court of Human Rights is sort of the um, the top court that decides the limits. Unfortunately, it has a very, in my opinion, um, regressive uh, case law on blasphemy. So for a long time, it has accepted that states can restrict free speech when, for instance, someone gratuitously offends religious feelings. So um, I don't know how many of you have watched the artistic film, um, uh, The uh, Visions of Ecstasy by, uh, by a, a British filmmaker called uh, Wingrove, um, but it's sort of a, a, a video that shows a nun in sort of a very sensual, interaction with a Christ figure. And that was censored by the British authorities uh, and the, the European Court of Human Rights said that's that's not a violation of free speech. Um, uh, more recently, it has said in 2018 that a an Austrian politician who held a seminar on, on Islam, uh, granted she was not very Islam friendly, but she said, you know, because uh, according to tradition, the Prophet Muhammad consummated his marriage with a, a girl who was nine years old at the time, he would, by, by our standards, be a pedophile. He was, she was, for those comments, she was fined under um, Austrian religious insult laws. And the, U the European Court of Human Rights said, this is not a violation of uh, freedom of expression. 
Um, and we have a range of cases uh, similar to that. And I think that really <laughs> is incredible on a continent like Europe where, you know, blasphemy has really been one of the central front lines for, you know, to, to combat against blasphemy norms uh, and the enforcement of such norms in, in the the long bloody march towards more free open uh, societies. Um, and, and obviously those legal doctrines are very different from the First Amendment protection here in the US where um, you, you do have a right to be gratuitously offensive to uh, religious people. You might remember there was a a Florida pastor back in 2010 or 11 who uh, burned the Quran and the Obama administration reached out to that person and said, listen, you are you might be endangering uh, military personnel in Afghanistan, but they had no powers to compel him to uh, to stop from that. He was he, he had he had the, the right uh, to do so. And even though, again, I don't sympathize sympathize with with his actions, um, I think it's a better um I, I prefer having the right to be gratuitously offensive. Also, I think there's a danger to to sort of we have a tendency to, especially when it comes to book burnings, to sort of look at it only through through the lens of Nazi book burnings. Um, but of course, these were book burnings that were initi initiated or supported by an, a totalitarian state. Uh, these were not um, acts by uh, by private uh, individuals. And you know, if you in 1933, 1933 had had burned Mein Kampf, you very likely would have been executed. Uh, so it was not you know a, a Nazi policy of of commitment to to free speech. But and and there are I think important examples in history uh, of why even something as provocative as as burning texts can be um, a, a valuable outlet of protest. So you've seen, for instance. In India, you've seen uh, Dalits, or so-called untouchables or casteless, burning Hindu texts that justify um, social discrimination against uh, lower castes. In here in the U.S., we've seen um, people burning the the U.S. Constitution as a protest against slavery uh, in in the nineteenth century, and so on. So, so it's not that you know burning books uh, is, is necessarily sort of a far right uh, agenda. It can be uh, a legitimate outlet of protest. Um, feminists in the in the US burned um, speeches of Woodrow Wilson because he wouldn't uh, he wouldn't advance the right of women uh, to vote. Uh, and, and so I think even those shocking and offensive methods of symbolic expression should be allowed whether they whether they, you know, um, offend religious uh, or philosophical or political sensibilities mm. um we're a little bit over time but if it's okay with you both i just want to get to a couple more questions we can we can do them as quick as possible um i know some people might have to in the audience might have to go um i just want to touch on a couple quickly i think leo asked about whether we potentially see a reaction from a, a state like israel if like a, a jewish text or like the torah was being but Correct me if I'm wrong, that, that did actually happen recently, didn't it? I think somebody went opposite the Quran burning stunt with a Bible and a Torah to burn them, and there was uh, there was effectively no response. So um, that has happened. Um, Asma is asking, I think, about, um, um, about her doctoral research on blasphemy ideologies on the pa pa Pakistani diaspora in Canada. Um, the question's about going back to British India. So I'm really sorry, Admiral, we might leave that one, but because um, we're just looking at kind of the European responses here. But if you email me, maybe I can pass it on. Um, I'll put my email afterwards. Um, I'll come to my friend Phil, who very kindly alerted me that the chat function wasn't working while I was trying to implore everybody to uh, send questions. So thank you. Phil asked, um, you know, he's an ex-security guy, so no surprise he asked this one. Um, asked about whether it was the security services in Denmark and their fear of being overwhelmed with investigations and threats that may have ultimately influenced the adoption of the legislation. Um, so I don't live in Denmark anymore, but I did look into this. My understanding is that the primary motive for the Danish legal change, which was pushed forward by a social democratic uh, prime minister, was a Turkish 
pressure regarding um, getting Sweden, uh, a Swedish membership of NATO. It was really above all about um, uh, security policy uh, and country to country mm. pressure. So uh, Jacob can um, can correct me if uh, I'm wrong. Yeah. Initial versions of the bill, uh, the association of uh, uh, the police association was uh, adamantly opposed. Uh, to 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 these um, to the to the at least the first couple of drafts of this bill and I it, it, enforcement uh, is really difficult I mean, it's by way of example there's an Iranian feminist uh, who has staged uh, uh, um, sit-ins where she grates uh, a copy of, of the Quran on a on a cheese grater uh, in protest against the misinterpretation of the Quran by the Iranian regime. Uh, should she be uh, arrested? Uh, or is it just the far right that should be arrested? These, these types of situations uh, are impossible uh, for, for, um, for the police to deal with and invites uh, or reach and invites, uh, before you know it, you know, the people who are doing uh, the uh, acts get arrested for disturbing the peace rather than the people who carry out the violent demonstrations. Uh, so it's uh, it's an impossible situation. I will point out that, um, the re as you say, Liam, yeah, uh, nobody really uh, is going to protest the burning of the Bible much. I mean, there might be somebody, but it, it's not um, a, a sacrosanct. Um, it's a book. It's uh, But for, for, Muslim, for Muslims, the Quran is the literal word of, of God. And that's why the treatment of the Quran is is different. It's not that there's this sacred book and there's that sacred book and why are we doing, why can't we just burn all the books? I mean, it doesn't really matter if if you burn a copy of the Bible. That's not, um, you go to the bookstore and buy another copy, right? And it's a book. Hmm. Well, great. Um, yeah, I think, uh, so I think I was going to ask Rachel's question, but I think Jacob kind of touched on it in one of his responses, but I will ask a version of it because uh, Rachel's asking what what do we recommend to policymakers instead of adoption of like the Danish legislation? I mean, it's all it's very easy, I know, to say, well, we should just defend freedom of speech. But when we're under the kind of both security pressure and dipl dipl diplomatic, excuse me, pressure, um, you know, that is we shouldn't pretend that that's easy for policymakers to face, I guess. Um, so maybe ask that one, you know, what, what can we do to, Rachel asked, what can they do to support both peaceful coexistence between communities with different beliefs and freedom of expression, obviously very delicate balancing act. But if I may, can I lower the bar on that one a little bit or make that one a little bit more of a grassroots question? Because what we've seen in some of the blasphemy controversies affairs in Britain is people, you know, on the front lines of, you know, kind of community facing work uh, like thrust at the center of these controversies um you know they didn't choose to be you know elected politicians standing up for freedom of expression i think in one of them like it's a cinema manager having to talk down a mob uh in another controversy it's you know a child's mum and a local police officer um it might be somebody from a local authority you know a local councillor or a, even a council worker you know what how do these people who they find themselves at the center of these blasphemy affairs how do they what can they do about that? I know that's a really horrible question. So, um, but it just strikes me as, as relevant because we're seeing this on a, you know, not on not just on a nation to nation scale or a terrorist group to nation scale, but on a, you know, a very localized um, footing as well. I think there's, you know, I think governments can, um, you know, if Russell's Paladin, this far right um, uh, compulsory Quran burner, um, he has really extreme. Uh, opinions um and i think there's nothing wrong with the with the government condemning his opinions while at the same time saying that free speech protects such opinions they don't represent danish society as a whole they don't represent the views of the government but we find it valuable to protect um ideas and expressions that we vehemently uh disagree with um, I think it would also have been wise for the Danish government learning from the cartoon affairs where a number of Danish Muslims traveled around 
uh, the the Islamic world and gave sort of a highly uh, skewed view of what had happened and which helped inflame um, you know the conflict. If they if the Danish government cultivated Danish Muslims who you know uh, could ex you know who who agreed that these things should not be criminalized that you know that it's it's bad for Muslims um, to 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 um, to to criminalize blasphemy to have them sort of stand at the ready and explain, you know, go on on Al Jazeera Arabic, uh, go to dispatch them to Cairo or Pakistan and give sort of a um, um, a Danish Muslim perspective, if you like, that differs from the from Danish government so that it doesn't necessarily just became, become sort of um, the West versus Islam. But no, actually you have uh, Danish Muslims who um, who say that it's in our interest to uh, to protect um, these uh, values, even if it might offend our sensibilities, and can sort of explain this the situation with more legitimacy uh, than perhaps uh, the the government. I think that would have been a wise strategy if the, if, for instance, our Minister of Foreign Affairs had cultivated persons like that who could be sort of a rapid reaction force when when things like this uh, happen. Unfortunately, it takes a very brave individual, I think, to want to do that, and that's of reflection of the state of affairs. In the, in, the, in, the, in the U.S., for instance, um, the U.S. has a um, um, ambassador to the OIC. They tend to be of Muslim uh, background. They will stand firm on First Amendment uh, on First Amendment doctrine. Um, I, you know, there. Are, so, so it's. I, I don't think it's. Uh, it's it's impossible. Of course, it's a big ask in 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 in, in certain ways. But I think it might help um, create a, a different uh, narrative than than the ones that uh, that tend to emerge after these uh, kinds of um, of incidents. <clears throat> but I do think it's incredibly important for for a democratic governments to explain why free speech is important and why it's important for minorities. You know, explain uh, you know that in 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 our, our history is full of minorities, including religious minorities whose rights were um, systematically violated. That the you know until the Dan the Danish Constitution, you know you had to be a member of the Danish state church. Yeah, that was forcible baptism and so on. Which you know, and what what's the reason we don't have that? It's it's this secular suite of rights, prominently among them freedom of expression and freedom of religion, and you can't have that, uh, and at the same time demand that your religious feelings are not offended. Uh, so we have to make the case for free speech, but in a way that is not necessarily antagonistic uh, to those who feel offended. No, I would just make two points very quickly. One is that uh, there's already plenty of laws uh, in place uh, for the police to step in when a public peace is being disturbed and if violence is brewing, break up demonstrations, break up um, things that are, you know, going like in, in Gothenburg uh, where uh, violence really did and uh, break out in a big way. Um, the, the police does have the authority to uh, step in certain uh, su such circumstances. Free speech is uh, is not absolute, uh, and even in this country, there are circumstances under which where uh, speech can't safely take place. Uh, and the other thing, I there was a question that I noticed in in, in the sidebar uh, about Muslim, how Muslims actually uh, think about these issues, and uh, as it so happened. Uh, uh, the Pew uh, survey research uh, asked that uh, what uh, people thought about uh, blasphemy in a, in a survey conducted in Muslim majority countries, and the overwhelming response was that it was uh, for the hereafter. It was uh, for judgment to be passed on 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 things like blasphemy. That this was not uh, for the circular uh, secular authorities to step in and uh, and, and and punish it uh, these are offenses that um you know it, it judgment belongs to to god in these cases and i think uh, 
uh, in that regard, there's uh, the difference between Christians and Muslims is probably uh, much less than the uh, card you think because of the way the public debate has developed. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, this that came up in my research for the for the paper was that that was more or less the consensus. There's some jurisprudence, excuse me, to to back that up. That it's you know it's not something that will be handled in this life. It's for the hereafter. But I think um, Ayatollah Khomeini may have changed that with his or paragraph fatwa. Um, anyway, look, I'm really sorry for those of you um, whose questions I didn't get to, but um, do email me if you'd like to. Um, and I, I, you know, I know both of our speakers are very busy people, but um, yeah, maybe I can forward them on if they have time just to to get back to them. If you had a burning question. Um, thank you so much to everyone who joined. I know we went a little bit over time, so thanks for staying with us. Um, and we will be sending out a YouTube link to this. Um, and again, most of all, thank you to our speakers um, and for going a little bit over time. And I know this is the first thing you've had to face in the morning for both of you. So, um, you know, gave a very solid, spirited defense of freedom of expression first thing in the morning, which I know is not an easy thing to do. Um, so... <laughs> Thank you. Any final words before we sign off? Just thanks. It's been a pleasure, privilege. Thank you. You're too kind. No, I'm really glad we could do this. And um, look, I think this is unfortunately an issue that isn't going away. So I think um, it's really glad to do this from uh, from the perspective of, I guess, bringing the two worlds of counter extremism, counter terrorism, and security with that kind of broader debate and discussion around freedom of expression. So I think you've both navigated it expertly. So thank you. Um, yeah, we will log off and thanks again to everyone for joining us. Thanks.